I really have microphone en- envy. That thing is great. This? Yeah. <laughs> it's worth it. I like it. You have fun with it. Hey, can somebody post something in chat just to make sure you guys can see us and hear us? Tyson does karaoke when he's not doing this. Per- perfect. Thank you. I, I do with my daughter. We actually will, will do little sing-alongs with YouTube, and then she gets mad at me for not singing that well. But uh, hey, everybody joining us, if you like this content, content, find it useful, love it for you to tell a friend, give us some big hearts on LinkedIn. We are the largest community of forward-thinking M&A practitioners in the world. Um, and the goal of this podcast is to learn M&A, walk away with some new ideas to overcome your challenges. We want to make sure this is interactive, fun, valuable. So ask questions about your own challenges that you're facing. Feel free, if you're on the Zoom link, to use the raise your hand option. I'll put you live. You can come talk to us. Otherwise, you can uh, use chat and we'll pay attention to chat and I'll get some of your questions as they fit in the conversation or afterwards. Uh, what else we got? We had our conference last week and I'm, I'm kind of relieved it's over with. Huh. Michael, you're there hanging out. Happy hour. Oh, it was good. It was, it was amazingly like seamless, you know, Vir- virtual felt much more natural than I thought it would. It's surprising how well you can do like a happy hour. We had one for our company with a hundred people on it and you would think that would just be totally untenable, but it worked pretty well. Yeah. I am. I'm satisfied. I, I like the results. We got great survey responses, some feedback to improve next time. I, uh, I know there's suggestions about doing it in person, but I, I, that's the old world. You know, I think we're going to leave that behind and really focus on delivering the digital experience since that's the nature of our business. Uh, I, I know the next event that I'm going to be involved with is the HR M&A Roundtable Conference that's coming up September 22nd, 23rd. I'll post a link if anybody else wants to hang out with me over there. I went last year and it was cool because I got to meet some rock stars in M&A. And you've probably seen them on the podcast, like Jillian Cablesick at Sissick from Caterpillar, Kim Jones from Microsoft, Sally Cunningham from, uh, she was a GE now at Danaher. Those podcasts are online and um, they're great podcasts. So I, I recommend listening to them. But I met them all at that conference. It's a practitioner led event um and then michael we're working on happy hour next week we're going to try to experiment i'm not going to do an interview next week my marketing team has a big backlog of stuff they're trying to catch up on for the conference but they're trying to make nice summaries and stuff like that so uh we're going to send it out on monday but we're going to do a little networking happy hour because that's a feedback i got people want more networking opportunities so we're doing uh, m a unplugged next wednesday at uh 5 30 i think eastern time something like that 6 30. 6.30, yeah. So we'll be there with, uh, you know, bring your friends, bring a bottle of scotch or you know, whatever non-alcoholic beverage you prefer. You guys ready to do this? Yeah, born right. ready. Welcome to M&A Science Live. You're tuned in to the world's greatest podcast for M&A. Putting companies together is complicated and taking them apart is even more complicated. On this podcast series, we interview top-level M&A practitioners to learn lessons from their experience. Learning proven techniques is key to perfect your M&A practice. I'm Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of Deal Room. I spent 10 years as an M&A advisor and realized M&A is highly inefficient and the technology is basically a landfill of trash of mostly Excel sheets and PowerPoint. Uh, I started Deal Room in 2012 to pursue the opportunity to redevelop these landfills into skyscrapers that are high-speed connected skyscrapers that deliver real value. And uh, today joining me is Michael Frankel, SVP and Managing Director at Deloitte. Michael leads Deloitte's new venture accelerator, which creates, builds, grows hybrid businesses that are services coupled with tech, business models across the firm. He drives growth strategies through ecosystems, acquisitions, operational improvements, organic build strategies, and corporate venturing. Before joining Deloitte, Michael led corporate development at a large technology and information services company, and he's closed on over 100 deals. Also joining me, Bruce Bowden, CFO of Interactions, former head of North American M&A for PepsiCo, former global head of M&A for Nokia, former EVP of corporate strategy and development at, I always say it, Nuance, Nuance. And Bruce has closed more than 100 transactions with total deal value in excess of $10 billion. 
now CFO of a leading provider of artificial intelligence for customer care. Today's discussion, sourcing deals and M&A is a pretty extensive process. You need a criteria that aligns with your strategy. And once you find an interesting opportunity, the dating begins. Today, we're going to discuss the cultivating relationships with the deal target. You laughed at that. Yeah, I knew you were going to get that in there. I didn't realize so quick. Oh, that's going to be the whole theme. That's going to come back like every other question. Uh, can you guys kick off by briefly describing your experience with fostering relationships with deal targets? Leave it to you, Michael. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's one of those art, not science things about M&A that I love. Um, but I think it's massively important. I think that relationships with with potential targets drives everything from better diligence to better integration to easier negotiations to a higher likelihood of getting the deal done. So I I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, uh, about how to develop those relationships and what makes it both complicated and fun is your strategy and approach totally varies based on the nature of the target and based on the nature of the relationship you want to have with them. So it, which which is it adds a whole layer of complexity to it, but makes it really interesting to, to try to master. So I, I, I love that part of the exercise. And I also love it. The other thing that strikes me is because it forces the strategy effort that I think corp dev people are all often frustrated isn't happening, right? Um, we all hate it when a business leader comes and goes, I haven't really thought about the market. I haven't thought about the strategy, but I'd like to buy this company, please. Um, so, you know, doing that work you know, months or years in advance um, to build the relationships also forces you to ask the question, okay, what's our strategy? What's our, our crisp goal? What do we need? Not just what are we trying to grow, but what do we need out of a target? So for all those reasons, I love this, this part of the process. Um, I think one of the interesting things that uh, Kaizen and Michael both know, and probably a lot of the folks on the call know, know as well, is that there's no substitute for for repetitions in in M and A, you know, you you the more deals you do, um, the more deals you close. In particular, uh, you you just see something new uh, for a long for a long time. You're seeing something new on every deal, and then maybe it slows down. But on deal number ten and deal number one hundred, you you may see something new. And I think this is one of those areas that where that's most evident because. I, I can't think of, you know, you can see trends in what the relationship aspect means in a deal, but, um, but it means something different in a lot of different contexts. So this is a really rich and complicated question that has uh, different answers for different situations. Um, from my side, you know, having been in the roles that I've been in, I've uh, bought and sold companies all over the world. So I have cultural difference companies of all different sizes from, you know, five people to, to 5,000 people. Um, so the dynamic of dealing with companies of different sizes is, is a thing, industry verticals. So it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, as Michael says, it's a, it's a soft side of this. There, I think you can, like a lot of the soft sides of M&A, repetitions help, and you can also uh, apply some amount of science to it in the end. So hopefully we can bring a little bit of useful science to what could otherwise be a very subjective thing today. These are some really good points. So I see the value of developing the relationships early because then it can help make the rest of the process a lot easier by having that level of alignment. And then also the variances on the strategy, depending on the company's size and, and the overall purpose of doing the deal. And like Michael said, don't buy the company and then try to figure out the strategy. So um, with that, what, why is it important to create the relationships with your deal target and how far in advance of the deal would you want to start doing this? So I think the first question is, what are you, what are you trying to achieve with the deal? Because that'll determine both the nature of the relationship and how far in advance. So the first thing is, do you know what your likely targets are, right? Which is a matter of not only strategy, but also the evolution of the space. Um, because you can, you know, you can invest infinity effort in building relationships with every player in the market. So you can't, you just, it's physically impossible to do that. So you have to get fairly specific and know, here are the five, 10, 15 companies that are my most likely targets where it's worth the investment to build a relationship. So that's number one. Number two is, um, it depends on what you want out of the target. 
you know, the more and and how likely it is to be you are to be able to avoid a competitive process. So, you know, the more likely that relationship is to have an ROI for you, the more you want to invest in it and the further back you want to go. Like my extreme example would be founder owned business where there's only one of that asset. And I had a deal like this uh, a couple of companies ago, founder owned business. There's no other asset in the space like it. We know that the founder is going to retire in the next few years. The founder really cares about the team. These are people who have worked for him for 30 years and, um, and he's already very wealthy. So money is a variable, but there are a bunch of other variables that interest him. For us, that was the, the, the sort of the perfect storm of build a relationship. And we started the relationship two years in advance. And built it up slowly, understood him, understood his priorities. He got to know us. We did some ecosystem relationships. And so by the time he was ready to sell, we got dibs. And that not only meant that we got the deal, probably got it at a lower price, and our competitor was really mad that they couldn't get it, but it also meant that we'd done a lot of our diligence already. So, so that was sort of the, the, the ideal state um, uh, where you want to you want to invest far in advance. But I think that these relationships, if you can, I go back to my first point, if you can figure out the company you're likely to be buying, there are so many benefits to developing the relationship. That's the deadly part is if you invest all that time in a company, you decide you didn't want to, you don't want to buy them. It's a lot of burnt time. Bruce, do you- yeah, I think that's all true. And I think the second thing you need to figure out, I think you're exactly right. There's the, that, that you should have a clear strategic view of who your target set is. I think the second question you ask is within each of those targets, who's the decision maker or who is the person with who's the person uh, with, who, with or who are the people because there are going to be more than one that where the relationship is important. It might be the lead venture investor. It might be the chairman of the board. It's very often, of course, the CEO, because um, if it's a good CEO, he um, he or she probably can speak for uh, the, the board or will be able to sway the board to some degree, or at least understands what the board's are and, the, and the shareholders' interests and constraints are. So um, so I think, you know, when you're operating in an industry space, you start to know who, who uh, your logical targets are for, for whatever kind of expansion you're looking to do, whether it's geographic or product set or what, what our team or technology or what have you. But um, uh, then figure out who the decision makers are and start, and start building the relationships. One of the realities, I, I think, is, uh, you know, sometimes there's a process, right? The, they've hired a bank and they're, they're going into a sale process and, hopefully you've already built some relationship if the company's interesting, but we all get surprised or we all get a, or we all see a shiny penny from time to time when these processes start and you say, you decide you want to dig in. So then you kind of have to go into catch up mode, but, but hopefully most of the time, as Michael said, you're, 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 you know, your space well enough, you know, the players and you've spent, you've spent some time um, figuring it all out. Yeah. And, and one point I'll make, you could even go further and say, it's not just relationships with decision makers there may be other critical parties in the organization. You know, if you have a technology business, um, even if the CEO and the shareholders control the business, if you've got a brilliant technologist who developed it, you want to get to know that person too, because that may be a critical component of the, of the, of the acquisition. You don't want to lose that person. So the more you can build you, that relationship and your brand with them, um, you know, the, the better you are for a variety of reasons, including you know, what I'd call reverse diligence, right? The, the sellers have other variables than money that they're concerned with. And um, I, I've always thought that M&A is this fascinating situation where you have two parties who have blind spots where they don't have information on the other party. And a lot of the M&A process and the negotiation process is trying to bridge the gap between distrust around those topics, right? Mm-hmm. Is your tech really what you say it is? Will you treat my people the way you're saying you will, and you you won't destroy my brand? Um, you know, you'll you'll be fair with me during the the earnout process, whatever it is. And so that relationship building um, builds trust, and it also builds intel. Like a good example is if you spend a year working with my company, you see how I treat my people, you see how we treat our employees. It gives you a much better sense of what we're going to do with your employees when they arrive, the benefits, the morale. You know, there's a variety of things like that. So I think it 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 has a lot of benefits to the seller as well um, as as to the buyer. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a there's a um, uh, an interesting thing that I sort of I think figured out over the course of the time I spent focused on M and A, which is a lot of time one of your your industrial your industrial thesis about an acquisition is to to fold a product into your portfolio or to access a new market of some kind or um, so in some ways you're going to market you're go, you're going to go to market with the thing that you buy and one of the best ways to try that out is to not buy it right away if, especially if it's not in a sale process but say, you know go to your go to this company and say hey you know, let's sign an NDA and let's talk about who, some of our prospects and whether if we went to them together and 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 put our tech put our technologies or our product sets, you know, link them together in a more compelling way, would we be a better value proposition for these for this customer? And let's try it and see if it works. And um, you know, if you if you try that, if it if it works, you've 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 got at least one proof point for for your integration theory. And you're building the relationship. Um, and if it doesn't work, you may dodge a bullet, uh, or you may learn things about how to make it work better, or whether it would work better with someone else. So, you know, uh, I, I want to avoid too much the, uh, the 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 dating analogy, but you know, the, you, the getting married on the getting married after the before the first date, which which sometimes happens, is is maybe not the way to go. I mean, um, a lot of the best deals that I've I've been involved in for the companies that I've worked with have been um, partners that that after two years were like, boy, you know, this is just great. Yeah, uh, we should we should do this. We should do this for the rest of our lives. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the arguments I hear against that sometimes as well, but we're going to make them more valuable, right? We're going to, and I think that is the highest class problem in the world. I would much rather pay five percent more in purchase price and eliminate the risk that. The offering doesn't work. My clients don't want to buy it, right? That, that, that risk is, is worth much more to me than giving them a little bit of a goose in, in, in valuation in the, in, the, in the process. So, yeah, no, I totally agree. The other one that, that I find is subtle, but I think, frankly, particularly on, on Juneteenth is probably an important one to point out, is the subtle value of cultural diligence. Um, uh, I'm not saying this is a common scenario, but... You know, you don't necessarily, if you read a data room, you don't uncover a toxic culture. You don't uncover a, a, a culture with biases or, you know, misogyny or anything else because they don't put that in the data room. And so getting to know a company and spending a little time and understanding the team uh, is going to uncover culture issues that are, I mean, maybe not as extreme as that, but you know, whatever culture issues there are, you'll get a better sense of them. And then you can decide whether or not they're things that are salvageable that you can cause to be effective merging with your business or whether it's a, it's a non-starter and you want to walk away. Um, those things are hard to uncover in a quick sprint of due diligence. So um, from others, others out there that have a short tension span, like I do, <laughs> we just talked about, it's almost like earlier, the better essentially identify the key people that you really want to build those relationships with and really use this opportunity to, to nurture the relationship, develop the trust. And uh, as, as Michael's point about even looking for some of these opportunities to test the theories and, and have a, a partnership to be able to even validate that uh, before going into that kind of permanent commitment. And uh, also like um, uh, Michael also mentioned was uh, culture diligence as well. So um, that, you know, we can start early, get a sense of what that fit and feel is going to be like. Well, can you walk me through the scenarios? Because we, we, you talked earlier about different strategies require a different approach. And to get a sense of, and you touched on a little bit, like, hey, if, I, if this person's so core to the business, I'm going to spend a lot more time developing that relationship. Walk me through the different scenarios and those different approaches that you would take in developing those relationships. Sure. I mean, um... I, you know, Michael already called out one typical, one sort of archetype, which is the founder-owned uh, successful startup target. And you know, this is a this is a a person or a small group of people usually who had a vision and took a, an enormous amount of risk. The the entity is in some ways like their child. 
um, and they have a they have a love and a protectiveness for it and for the entity. We'll forget about the people. Of course, they have that for the people as as well. But it's but they almost attach this humanity to 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 the company that they've built. Um, and so that's a that's a classic archetype. And and they they don't care if uh, you know that someone if some if if a bad person comes along and wants to pay them a ton of money. Uh, for their baby, they some of them will say yes anyway, but a lot of them just won't. So they 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 need to trust you, as as Michael said earlier. Um, I think that when you're buying from a uh, if you're buying a company that is, however, owned by a single uh, shareholder, either a private equity firm, a venture firm, or or a corporation, um, you're dealing with a whole different dynamic. The 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 CEO or the general manager of the business unit or whatever is going to have a say. And if they're, like I said earlier, if they're a good CEO, they'll have some sway uh, over the decision makers. But ultimately th this is a, this, this seller is gonna make an economic decision. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, figuring out how to uh, give yourself a relationship with that owner seller, uh, more, more likely because it'll help you get more information yeah. uh, that will enable you to be the best bidder. Cause they're ultimately, they may like you, but if you're not the best bidder, you're probably, you're probably not going to yeah. um, prevail there. It's not a beauty contest for them. It's it's uh, so, so I think um, that's really just about information, uh, information asymmetry between you and the other buyers. Um, so that's a couple of archetypes. I'm like, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah. And, and, and Bruce, I'd say even on that one, you're right. that They're going to be very dollar focused, but they may still be, you may still be able to sway them with likelihood of close, right? So if you show them, we've been talking about this business for a year. I understand it. I've thought through the issues. Then the likelihood that I walk away from the deal is a lot lower. And for them, you know, the math is price, and certainty of close. So you can at least try to affect the certainty of close uh, 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 part of the equation. And you may be able to, the more diligence, the more information you get, the more you'll be able to sharpen your own pencil on and uh, on, on price. Um, yeah, I think the, 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 the other variable I'd put, so the, the, those kinds of archetypes, um, and there are a bunch of sort of variants in the middle. I think the other very, uh, sort of way I'd slice it is the nature of the relationship that you're building. So are you building a, you know, ecosystem relationship? Are you going straight into a potential buyer relationship? Are you just developing a relationship because we're both in the same space, we should know each other. Um, so there's a lot of ways to sort of initiate that conversation depending on the nature of the, of the company and what's gonna be most appealing to them, right? Often the ecosystem relationship is the most appealing is it's revenue right now. Um, and they may be a little twitchy about a potential buyer, right? Um, the flip side is sometimes the buyer card is what makes them open to sharing information um, because they're nervous about you as a competitor. Uh, so you sort of have to suss them out and figure out what, what their deal is. That's why I like to have some intelligence about them, right? Cold calling is, you know, if you come with a big business card from a big organization, Sure, you, you can get them on the phone through a cold call, but they're going to be nervous. It's going to be weird. It's often good, even when you're coming, you're, you're a giant acquirer and everybody knows you, it's still good to come with a personal introduction. Um, it puts them at ease. It, it, you know, it starts the conversation in a way that's not, I am a buyer and I'm here to talk to you about acquisition. Um, so I try to do that sort, of, that sort of soft entry. And it brings up one other point that I think is interesting to think about, which is, who in your organization should be doing this? Who should be building that relationship? Is it the corp dev person? Is it your business lead who would be the, the acquisition? Is it someone in your sales organization who's playing in the same market? Um, is it some of your tech organization, your innovation organization who's playing with the same technologies, attending the same conferences? Um, and so you have to sort of figure that out. And part of that's based on what will work best with them and what your ultimate goal is. Um, you know, uh, if, if you want to retain the management team, I might argue that getting the business leader to build that relationship is more powerful because at the end of the day, the corp dev person walks away at the end of a deal. What I want to know is I'm going to go work for Keyson afterwards. Is he nice? Is he a jerk? Is he, does he understand the business? Is he going to work with me? So building that relationship may be more important than the, you know, than the corp dev person. Yeah, I, I think I would go one further than that, Michael. And I would say, having having said 
earlier on the call that every situation is different. I think one thing that is almost a universal truth is that you want the business owner to build to build a big part of the relationship, not the corp dev person or a shareholder or or a, or an advisor or someone like that. It's there's just no you know that's the person who's got to deliver the from your perspective as the buyer, whether that's exactly what the seller wants or not. From your perspective as a buyer. That's the person who's going to own the delivery of the value of the deal, and um, and so I think you you want them in it deep. Uh, yeah. Well, how how do you frame that though? Do you because obviously you're not bringing them on the front end. You got somebody in. in sure you are. Them. You might. Yeah. I, I mean, in the best deals that I've done, they brought the, those people brought the deal to me. I didn't bring right. it to them. Yeah. I mean, I, I I don't like deals that go from corp dev to the business. I like deals that come from the business to corp dev. And I especially like deals that come from the sales team to corp dev. Yeah. Because the sales team, the sales team has their, their, no one has their finger on the pulse of what this customer set wants more than them. And if they keep walking into meetings and the same other company has just walked out, whether it's a competitor or a, or a, uh, a you know, a, an adjacent offering or what they, they, they know, they'll, they'll know about it. Oh, yeah. So now you're, you're obviously having conversations. So you're on the radar. They know who you are and, and the opportunity comes up and like, Hey, Bruce, there's this company that would be interesting. I mean, are they sort of making the introduction of you to the CEO of the company or sure. what, what does that look like? Yeah, very often. I mean, I, 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 I don't even, you know, I'm not greedy about the relationship. I don't, um, other than making sure that they don't start throwing numbers around with a, with a target without having had had the corporate development team and uh, come in and, you know, make sure that they make sense. Uh, I, I, I don't have an issue with them going as far as they can in building a relationship before I'm ever, ever part of it. Bringing in corp dev and bringing in bankers changes the whole dynamic. Uh, you know, it, 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 it is um, the, 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 if you're talking to a, a divisional GM, suddenly the senior leadership of the company is interested or the shareholders hear about it and they want to know what's going on. Um, they, you know, People might get the idea, hey, well, if that corp dev guy is lingering around, we're about to get put in play. I better figure out how to package this up and think about a process. So you introduce competitors to the mix. So I, I don't, it's like lawyering up, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't think you should, the longer you can go without corp deving up, uh, the better, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Or you position corp dev as your, as, as being the ecosystem negotiator, right? So it's, you know, I'm bringing the corp dev guy in to figure out how we do a partnership or an alliance or something like that. But yeah, I, I, I totally agree. There's nothing better than a, than a CEO to CEO relationship. And, I, and Bruce, I'll take what you said about salespeople further. I've always thought that the best market intelligence I've ever gotten is when I go to an industry conference, find a salesperson from, a, you know, a sales leader from, a, from a, another player in the space, and I buy them three scotches. It, because they know everything that's going on in the market, right? They're talking sure. to clients and clients tell them clients have no problem going, Oh yeah, your competitor was just here, you know, going in the wrong direction. So, um, you, and, and this is part of the reason this is all bespoke. You have to figure out for this particular target, what's the pitch, what's the hook, who's the right person in my organization. Maybe it's the CTO, right? If you have a wacky tech company founded by brilliant technologists, um, they may not have an interest in talking to the GM of the relevant business. They may have an interest in talking to the CTO of the relevant business because what they really want to do is kibitz about, about you know, AI applications. So you, you sort of have to figure it's, I mean, oh God, you're dragging me into your dating analogy, Kisan, but um, you sort of have to figure out what is it that they, they want, what will make it a, a, a good experience for them, um, and then sort of try to try to facilitate that dialogue. I think what Corp Dev's role is, is sort of orchestrating a little bit and gathering the information, right? So what are you hearing about this company? Um, you know, are they, are, they, are they maturing? Are they starting to get edgy to get out? Uh, you know, has their VC been in for seven years? Um, you know, that's, that's sort of Corp Dev's job is to figure out what's the M&A strategy and how do I refine it based on all the intel you're getting from this relationship? Yeah. God. By the way, Kaizen, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I was just I was monitoring the Q&A that was coming in. And one of the attendees who's anonymous asked a, a relevant question to what we're talking about here, which is how do you keep the business leader under control, yeah. not making promises, signing NDAs without knowing the terms, et cetera. Actually, I, I one of my previous employers, and I won't name which one to protect the innocent, but um, 
for the guilty. Uh, when, when I, one of the reasons the CFO and the CEO hired me to take the job there was that M&A had escaped into the wilderness in this company. And you had people all over the world engaging in all kinds of conversations and almost making offers and not only not just signing NDAs, but um, and the, the only way, in my opinion, it depends on what kind of organization you're in, but, but you have to create a process. You have to have a rigorous process around, you know, what we, we created what's called a, a hunting license. And a lot of people have a similar thing. You can't engage in a, you can't say to the person, Hey, well, have you ever thought about blah, 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 without, without going and getting your hunting license. And, and that there's a, there's a group of people that we had a, we had an MA committee that represented all the different corners of the business functionally. And, um, in terms of uh, operating units, because you don't know, you know, there may be some, there may be a conflict somewhere in the organization where you just don't want to be engaged in that. Maybe there's something going on commercially, or maybe some other business is looking at a competitor target and you, you just don't want to be caught. You don't want to be careless about it. NDAs should always get approved by legal. Corp dev should have a relationship with legal such that if an NDA comes in and it looks like a corp corporate development mm -hmm. context, you're, it's flagged to you. So, you know, you have to have you have to have clarity, communicated clarity and process to the entire business so that people know, you know, you may not. Now, if people go off the reservation, then the question becomes a little bit of a, you know, cultural question about the, the, the organization you're working for. Do you, do you do you fire people? Do you slap their hands and say you're you're it's fine this time, but never again, <laughs> or what? You know, and don't, that, don't buy companies that's without our permission. That's a lot more of a practical question and a than a company specific question. But if you don't even have a policy, you have no chance to control it. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you have to make it clear to them what the difference is between your role and our role, right? And and we're each going to do our role. Um, yeah, Isan, yeah. do you want to get to some of the other uh, questions? Oh yeah. Uh, well, I'm interested on on the dating stuff. What kind of pickup lines do you guys use to initiate the conversation? Check out my balance sheet. I love <laughs> I love everything your company has done. Everything I learn about you is it just gets better every time I hear something about you. I'm very impressed. So flattered. People, how impressive they are is you know is a, is a good one. Um, there's an there's an interesting one here uh, from Usman. Uh, when you're working on smaller deals, do you need a large team of advisors or a small team of advisors? It's a little, it's a little removed from the relationship, but but it's there's a there is a nexus to it. So, and I think I can answer for my part. Um, for a one to five million dollar deal, I wouldn't I wouldn't use a team of advisors. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't hire a bank for sure. I'd I'd use a lawyer, but I think if you have a corporate development team, you can execute that has some experience. You should just execute those deals without it without an advisor at all. Um, I, I think that the, the, the link, the nexus to the question about relationship is that um, I, I'm sure there are investment bankers on the on the on the um, uh, a call on the on the podcast, and some of my best friends, literally some of my best friends, are investment bankers. So it's I'm not being disingenuous when I say this, but there's a there's a there's a variety of experience in you know they're they're obviously there because in some instances they they can help create, they can help resolve differences and they can serve as an effective intermediary, but sometimes they can muddy the water too. Um, and I think when you're looking at a small deal like this, your risk of the situation getting perceived, perceived uh, misperceptions being created increases unnecessarily by using a lot of advisors. And I, I, I think um, they won't be mad about this, by the way, because they're not going to make a, a huge fee on a deal that size. So uh, most, of them, most of them will care uh, that I'm saying this probably. Um, but I, I, I would I would uh, focus especially on the the principal to principal relationship in that situation. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I, I always apply the the following logic chain, which is I, I don't hire I don't hire someone unless I know what their value prop is, right? So I hire an advisor when there's a benefit to hiring an advisor. Um, and and so if I have a corp dev team and it's a small and fairly uncomplex deal. There's got to be a reason why I would need a, a an advisor on top of that. Um, you know, uh, Usman had one other question right above, which is, you know, should you, if you're entering a new space, should you bring on an experienced manager in the space? Um, uh, so here's where I'll start. I'll start with if you're entering a new space, I, I would number one be hesitant to acquire into that space um, without having some deep expertise in your organization, right? Because 
uh, you know, you, you, you really risk, you know, having a giant foot fault on strategy or on knowing where the business is going. So my general view is I always want to have a business sponsor who is really knowledgeable about the space. Um, now, in some cases, if you really are entering a totally new space and you don't know uh, and, and you don't have anyone in your organization who is knowledgeable, then, yeah, I would I would try to bring an outside, you know, uh, some kind of outside advisor. But it makes me very nervous. My theory is if you're excited enough about a space to do an acquisition, you should be excited enough to hire a fairly senior operator. And either that operator operator will sit on top of these businesses or will find a role in them. But I, there's nothing that replaces 20 plus years of experience in an industry. That knowledge, there's a, it's very hard to find it anywhere else. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and um, one, of the, one of the cottage industries that the private equity community has created is these firms that um, basically link you into former employees or even current employees of targets. And they go and do, they go and do diligence on, on your target company by talking to someone who just left uh, or someone who's even still there and has the, you know, doesn't have an NDA or otherwise has the poor judgment to actually talk to someone who calls them. Um, that is, that's, that's gold. Um, you know, that you can, you can talk to, you can hire an expert in the, in the consumer electronics space or you can, or you can talk to the person who just got fired from company A, B, or C. And the person who just got, and, and, and usually you use one of these intermediaries to preserve your anonymity and so forth. But usually the person who just got fired is going to tell you a, a whole lot more of directly relevant stuff. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good point in terms of approaching that. And I think you got a really good point about the way you use advisors too, especially on the front end of just having those initial talks. I mean, there's, there's a little bit of learning curve to it, but that's something that you should just learn to do and uh, take that as part of your life skill set. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about mistakes. What are some of the common mistakes you see people go through when creating these relationships? So I've, I've got one up front that um, drives me absolutely bonkers and it sort of plays off of the, how do you control your business leaders? Um, I, I have, I have gotten on calls with companies where I brought in a business leader um, and then this is to Bruce's point, it'd be much better if the business leader already had the relationship, but I brought them in and the business leader sort of didn't mentally get their head around the fact that this is a dating uh, uh, conversation and interpreted it more as a combat conversation. So, you know, they started the kind of, and this is like the antithesis of Bruce's advice. They started the conversation by sort of strutting their stuff and explaining how good our offering is and how we're going to dominate and even going so far as to point out all the weaknesses in the other person's offering. Um, and, you know, they came away from going, that's a great call. And I was like, that, that they're, they, now they purposefully don't want to work with us, right? They, in fact, they want to go find a competitor, sell to the competitor and beat us. So, um, you know, managing the, the business leader who you're bringing in so they understand the purpose of building this relationship I think is is really important. And when you don't do that, it's brutal because first perceptions are really important, right? You know, you get off to the wrong foot and yeah, in theory, the largest price point wins, but you know, if we're jerks, then they're gonna go out of their way to find somebody who's not a jerk that they can work with. Yeah, I, I will, um, I'll be quick with my answer because it alludes to something we already talked about, but the the biggest mistakes that I've made are, are building relationships with people who just aren't the decision maker. It's just an enormous amount of wasted time and, and you, you, you think you're making progress and you're not. So, um, and I don't, I won't belabor that since we kind of already talked about it. I'll give you one more Kazan, because I think this is important. It's almost the reverse of what we've been talking about all along, which is falling in love. So, you know, <laughs> two years in advance, you map out your strategy. You think, you know, the most attractive target, and you start to build the relationship and they're great and it's really fun and you start to sell their offering in the market and you're getting along and there are a lot of steak dinners and you lose track of the fact that even though you like them, another competitor is eclipsing them in the market. Their technology is better, their brand is better and you sort of put on blinders because, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a, you know, you don't want to make that, you don't want to lose that investment. You don't want to have the experience that Bruce just described. And so you sort of, you know, self, 
self-perpetuate the idea that they must be the right target because I've invested so much time with them. So it's important to keep an unbiased view because the chance that you're going to be 100% right in advance about who the right target is, 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 is zero. So inevitably, some of these are going to be, are going to be wasted efforts. You have to be okay with that. So uh, make sure your goals are aligned, especially when you're working with uh, folks in your team on building this relationship. Make sure you're talking to the right people and you're not wasting your time developing relationships with non-decision makers. And uh, don't fall in love too early. Yeah. Kind of take your time and sort of make sure um, it's going to be a long commitment. And um, what do these relationships look like across teams? Should each team be forming some kind of relationship with the target? Talk a little bit about that. I mean, I think it depends. I think you have to go custom. It depends on the nature of the target and the nature of the relationship, right? So like if there's an if there's a co-selling opportunity, then you want your salespeople talking to their salespeople. If it's a co-development opportunity, you want their your tech people talking to theirs. If it's just building a general relationship in the market, then maybe it's GM to GM. Um, and it may be also GM to GM and corp dev to investor, right? So I think you know, multilateral relationships are more powerful because then you get multiple data streams, you get intel from different sources, and, and they sometimes conflict. Um, but you have to decide what what's organic, what makes sense, right? Like, you know, sometimes, you know, my, my girlfriend's dad was interested in hanging out with me. Sometimes my girlfriend's dad had no interest in talking to me. I think, you know, there are a lot of, um, I've been in situations where there was this desire to really deliberately map the relationships between, you know, okay, the, the owner is going to have the relationship with their owner and then the CEO is going to build a relationship with their CEO and the advisor with the advisor and blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I, I think it all gets a little tortured in some respects. The, the, the more important thing to me is that whatever you're saying to any of those uh, uh, counterparties, you should assume is getting back to the other counterparties. Yeah. And, um, and if I think if you're at an advanced stage, you're not planning who talks to who you're just you're 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 making sure you're coordinated in your messages or if you're not coordinated in your messages it's deliberate because you're trying to manipulate the situation to your advantage in some way um so i, I think i think um i would focus less on the who and, and i would focus more on the what of of what you're communicating to the different people folks you're engaged with what about when we look at relationship in terms of how that can affect negotiations yeah, I have a good story for that. Um, this isn't quite relationship, but sort of. Um, when I was at PepsiCo, uh, briefly, we bought Stacy's Pita Chips, um, which is one of my favorite deals because um, I love the product. Um, but and for a host of other reasons. But um, we were we were bidding against another big uh, food company. And um, we got down to the last two and asked for final bids and we submitted our bids and they were identical. We didn't know that until after the fact, but they were identical. And so Stacy and uh, her husband and their advisors went off into a non-smoke filled room because they're very healthy people. And, um, and in the end they chose PepsiCo because our team had, uh, uh, um, was mostly women. And Stacy is a huge advocate for women in business, and she just appreciated uh, the commitment that the company had um, to to diversity. And um, I would like to say that that had been deliberate, uh, but it was just that was the team that uh, that was that was the right team for the deal. Uh, we didn't I didn't plan it at all, but but I thought about that a lot, and and it, and it occurred to me to um, do more in deals in the future to understand uh, what people what people care about because you can you, you you can tie break but you can also maybe even you know uh michael talked earlier about deal certainty being an element i think there's an intangible element uh, depending on which kind of deal you're you're doing so you it, it pays to i think it can pay in the negotiation to know um uh what's what what the decision makers real hot buttons are yeah yeah that's actually a pretty interesting one that people individually have different motivators and, and drivers of what's behind the deal how, how do you get into that you know it's almost like you got to have a level of empathy to to be able to pick that up and I'm, I'm curious to know if that's 
But it, 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 was, it was a lot harder before all of the, the explosion of social media, but, um, but with this, the explosion of social media between LinkedIn and, and uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and whatnot, you can learn an awful lot uh, about someone. And it's, and it's for, for, for anyone who's really in that forum, asking to follow someone is broadly speaking, not considered an affront or over, over aggressive. So, you know, you, you really can learn an enormous amount. Um, uh, even even uh, the bios that people publish about themselves, not only on their website for their company, but if they go speak at an event or whatever, or you can see where they've shown up. Um, you, you, it's it's not really that hard to to figure out if people are politicos or if they have uh, if they're uh, an activist, if they have an activist cause that they're uh, committed to, or um, if they're you know children kids sports or whatever you know it's not it's not hard to find yeah yeah and, and see bruce's new school um and i i would give you the old school answer which is you know you find out a lot about people over a couple of dinners and a couple of beers um you know <laughs> inevitably one of the nice things about about you know having a longer set of conversations especially conversations that don't have an agenda to them is people inevitably meander, right? They inevitably go, uh, oh, well, well, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Or, you know, do you have any vacation plans? And you sort of start to peel the onion. You hear about people and you find things out. Um, And uh, by the way, wrapping into a question that came up, I think in, 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 in during this COVID period on the, on the downside, we're not having steak dinners, but on the other hand, you know, you go, oh, what, Bruce, what's that? What's that thing behind you? And yeah. and oh, it's a guitar. Oh, you play guitar? Oh, yeah, I played in a band in high school. Da, 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 da. And so um, I I think, Kisan, basically to your point, having empathy and treating the conversation as an exploration and just a, a human to human interaction, as opposed to I have four agenda items I need to get through them. Right? What's your price point? What's your um, you'll discover this stuff about people. People like to talk about themselves. They like to, you know, share those other parts of their lives. And, you know, what, and, and you, you hear stories about how they built the business. That'll tell you things about what they care about and what's meaningful to them. So, you know, I think it's one of the benefits of, but it's hard to do, it's very inorganic to do it like on the spot, right? We just started a deal process. Let's sit down and get to know each other, right? right, right, Is, right. You know, but if it happens over a year long period, um, it, it the, the stuff just sort of pops out. Yeah. Tell me about proposing. Do you have any unique ways of approaching that? Uh, proposing uh, deals or proposing marriage? Both. Okay. I mean, you know, in a deal context, yeah. <laughs> Are you like lighting up a bunch of candles and sort of, you know, setting the mood? Well, you know what I, I like to do is I, I, I think it depends on the situation, right? Obviously, if you have a um, if there's a deal process that you know that they're for sale, but if you're trying to initiate, which I, you know, is great to do because if you do it right, then you get a proprietary deal. Um, I like to start with what are your needs, right? This is not about me. I, I may want to buy your company, but your company isn't for sale yet. So right now it's about what are your needs? What are your goals? What are you thinking about for the future of this company? What are you thinking about for, for your own personal future? If we're talking about a founder and, then weave into it the possibility of of, of an acquisition, but it, it's it's got to be aligned to what you were trying to get done. Um, I can't reach these big markets because I'm not part of a large organization. Whatever it is that you know, and then frame the the potential of a deal around it. Right? I mean, here's the the, the other thing I'll say, and I'm curious where Bruce's reaction is. People aren't dumb, so. You know, if if two companies are talking to each other, especially if one of them is bigger and especially if one of them is acquisitive, to say nothing of if they're talking to the corp dev person, but even if it's a business person, of course they're thinking that that's a possibility. Nobody's like, what? Acquisition? Um, but I like to frame it with what what are you trying to achieve um, rather than just this is what I want out of it. Yeah. I, I also think, you know, there's there's a there comes a point after you've learned uh, enough to be somewhat informed on what you think a reasonable valuation is. I think there comes a point where you go to the decision maker and you, and you're just candid and you say, look, we're, we're interested at, 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 on the appropriate terms. And, and we think that's in the range, in a range between X and Y, Y being 
the number that you know they're going to hear and, and X being a way for you to position that you're a, a nice person for, by paying Y. But um, so, so I, I, and, you know, we don't want to necessarily go further if that's not interesting to you and, uh, and you put it out there and you're prepared to, you're prepared to um, step away if, if, uh, if, if that's not, you know, you're, I, so, so, and, and it's, it's really hard to go lower later, of course. So you got to be careful with that, but, um, but, but I, I think, I think there's, Michael's right. People are smart. If you, by the time you're far enough into this relationship that you're going to make an offer, they know you're, they know you're thinking of making an offer. Um, the one I, I kind of think about the next question though, which is what do you do if, if you say, I was thinking 10 and they say 10, I was thinking a hundred. Um, and then, you know, you can either say, you know what, never mind. Um, but what people very often do, and especially if they don't want to offend a person because they built a relationship with them is they, is they take the earn out route route. And, um, and I, I think that's a, um, that's a good way to preserve a relationship in the near term and ruin it in the long term, because it it just, it just, there are no, there are very few known instances of, of it all turning out with everyone, with everyone happy. Um, And usually, frankly, it's, Often it, it can often turn litigious or threat threats of, of litigation, and um, someone's always disappointed. Yeah, I agree. I think it's much better to say, "Let's just agree not to talk about this right now." And one of two things will happen: either they'll get their hundred offer, and you you know I was just wrong about the value, or somebody else had a higher value, or they'll have some more conversations. They'll talk to a banker. They'll realize that they're unrealistic, and they'll come back. And you've preserved the relationship because you, you know, you've made an effort not to offend them. Now, when you do a formal propose, you know, you uh, uh, pop the ring and, and ask the question and present the LOI. Is this sort of a lot of the stuff is already kind of laid out and there's a general level of confidence that things are going to be accepted? Or a lot of this stuff is just, hey, we're putting in writing for the first time and, and kind of have a lot of anxiety on their response? I think of I think of presenting an, a, a formal formal offer letter to acquire a company. If you're not in a competitive process where you're submitting bids, I think of it as a memorialization of something that you already know it's done. I I, I think of it. I analogize it to a, a board meeting for your company. I, I don't really ever want to go into a board meeting unless I pretty much already know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. Well, so yeah, you're pretty much set and had this discussion. And when you do do it, there's a good level of, of acceptance. And if there is a concern, it's usually something around the details. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, why bother? All you've done is spent a lot of, because, you know, writing these documents takes time, getting approval takes time. You, you might as well make sure you're in the same, on the, on the same page before you go down that process. Awesome. We're getting close to the hour guys. So last question I had was what's the craziest thing oh. you've seen in M and a you've okay. answered this question far too many times, Michael. So I'm gonna let you go first, Bruce. Um, I'm talking about Stacy's pita chips a lot today, but it is the craziest thing. Um, between the sign and close of Stacy's of the Stacy's deal, uh, I got a call um, early Sunday morning, like two a.m. Sunday morning, from Stacy's brother, and she and she said, "You need to get up here." I was living in the New York area at the time, and Stacy's is in the Cranberry Bog area of south of Boston. And um, you need to get up here, and I'm like, it, "It's two in the morning," and they're like, "You need you need to get up here. We have a problem." And um, the only factory that produces Stacy's pita chips had a catastrophic fire uh, and, and burned literally to the ground. There was, it looked like, it looked like one of those laser guided munitions had hit it because uh, one of the pita chips came out on fire from an oven and was going down a spiral cooling rack and the belt caught on fire and the, wow. the belt turned out to be flammable. And it, and it was, I think 2000 degrees at the hottest point in the center. Uh, and so, Later that Sunday, I had a call from uh, the the very famous uh, CEO of uh, PepsiCo asking me if we could get out of the deal. And I said, well, we could, but I'm not sure we should. And and David assured me that he'd have the thing up and running within two weeks. And I said, it's not even going to cool off within two weeks. But um, two weeks later, he sent me a picture with the day's the day's newspaper and pita chips running down they, they, they did a u-turn built a shed and uh and got it got it up and running again and and uh, closed the deal and it turned out to be a great deal for the company so i guess wow. the moral of the story is um 
you know, uh, it, there's there's no such thing as total catastrophe, but or, or or try to keep a cool, try to keep try to be the the cool head in the equation if you're the corp dev person. <laughs> wow, every deal has its hitches. <laughs> That's great. So I, I I thought about this, Kisan, and I tried to come up with one that was. It was focused on the relationship building aspect. So, um, uh, and was, you know, embarrassing to me, which I always think is the best way to, to end these things. Um, so I was uh, uh, looking at a company that I was really interested in and we'd been building a relationship with them for a while. And, and we'd sort of had that dance where they knew we were a potential acquirer, but we were talking about, could we partner together? Could we license their data? Um, and uh, they were in a really small town in uh, the middle of Ohio. And they said, well, we really want you to come down and meet the management team. They were the largest employer in this town, right? It was a, it was a, a real town company. And um, uh, I said, yeah, no, I'm glad to. And I'd been building the relationship uh, uh, because it was going to be a totally new business line for us. So there was no, no GM um, and I was the strategy lead. And so I drove down there. And the important thing to know is that I, I just had, um, and this is now you know good personal information, I just had a crown put in. Um, to one of my front teeth. Um, it's important that it's the front teeth. And I drove all the way to this very small town and um, I got to my room at the hotel in the town, giant gift basket with all these things that are produced in the town, um, including these like caramel pretzels. And I sat down to have a lovely local caramel pretzel at about 7 p.m. the day before I was gonna do this whole day meeting with them and uh, took a nice big bite of the caramel pretzel and one of my front teeth came out. So I just had big old gap right in the front of my face. And um, there's no dentists that I could find. It's like a Sunday night. So I went to a CVS and I found like, you know, and I, I've never had dentures. So I was like looking around for the right thing. And um, I got the tooth to sort of stay in my head. And the next day, but I didn't want to cancel the meeting and I didn't want to like, freak them out. This is the first time we were meeting in person, uh, uh, you know, with the whole management team. So I spent the whole day getting a tour of the building, meeting all the teams, meeting the development team, you know, having lunch with the CEO, desperately hoping, and, oh, and making a presentation about our company and what we do and how we could work together, desperately hoping that my front tooth wouldn't like fall out in the middle of the meeting. Um, you know, eating, I think I had like an egg salad sandwich for lunch, very gingerly trying not to smile too much. And I just remember the drive back and it all went great and, you know, really built the relationship. And I just remember on the drive back going, you know, just the biggest thing I was worried about was not my presentation, not anything else, but just, it's the only time in my life I've been concerned about like, you know, uh, uh, something falling out of my head during a business meeting. <laughs> You're so vain. <laughs> Great story, guys. I like it. I, I, I really appreciate the time today. You know, just to wrap off, I don't know if you guys have any shout outs or, or sign off things. Nothing? No special? No, thing? No, 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 no promotional opportunity needed. I, well, I, I'll throw a quick one just to shout out to our, our marketing team. For those of you that want some more structured content and written stuff to keep learning, uh, we're actually writing a lot of summaries from the conference that we did last week. So if you go to deal, I'll post a link here. But if you go to dealroom.net and just look at the blog over there, they got some really cool stuff. I was actually surprised reading it earlier today, really well put together. So highly recommend that. If you want to keep, keep reading, keep learning, you know, we're trying to catch our industry up. It, uh, it's a little behind. It may take 10 years to get us to 2020. <laughs> but uh, thank you guys so much for the time today. I really appreciate thank the conversation. You. Thank you. It was fun. Good to see you, Michael. Yeah, you too. Have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs>